Capuzzo, general manager, and together we're a global community dedicated to empowering women in sales with the network and the knowledge needed to be successful. Before we jump into the conversation today, I want to thank our partners for making events like this possible, and special thanks to GitLab and Prophecy.io for lending us the panelists on screen with me. Today, we're pushing back on the idea that conflict is always negative and instead exploring healthy strategies for disagreeing and advocating for yourself in a professional setting. Joining me in the conversation is Eileen Liu, Chief of Staff to the CRO at GitLab, and Kate Jack, Sales Enablement Leader at Prophecy.io. So Eileen, I'll hand it over to you first to tell us a bit more about yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie, and really excited to be here and join here with Kate as well as my co-panelist. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm currently the Chief of Staff to our CRO at GitLab. Um, in my previous lives, I've also held sales strategy analytics roles leading teams at both GitLab and Salesforce, which I grew my career. Um, and I currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area with my husband. Currently, it is raining like crazy, so if I ever go out of this panel, it means I have a power outage. So just <laughs> Warning you all up front for those of you who are also sympathetic to the California storms this past week. Uh, but thank you for having me here. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Setting expectations. <laughs> all right, Kate, what about you? That's awesome. Well, Eileen, I don't mean to make you jealous, but it is sunny and blue skies here in Atlanta, awesome. Georgia. So <laughs> I'll try and push it, push it westward uh, for you. But yeah, um, and thank you, Katie, for the opportunity. This is, um, I'm so excited to, to have this conversation. Um, Kate Jack, I am three days into my role at Prophecy. Um, previously, I've held various enablement roles um, as well as coming from a customer success background. Um, I do live in currently sunny Atlanta uh, with my husband and our two cats. So a little bit about me. Right. And unfortunately, Kate said she did kick the cats out of her office today. So they will not be making a special appearance, but <laughs> I did. Um, yeah. They're rooting yeah. you on from the basement. It sounds like. Yes, exactly. I think another time we'll, we'll have Penelope maybe as a panelist. So she's very talkative. Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, as a reminder to our audience throughout the conversation, let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat. And if you do have a question, there is an ask a question feature at the right side of your screen. Throw it in there and we'll get to it during the Q&A portion. So without further ado, let's jump into this first question. This is for both of you and we'll kick it off with Eileen. Do you think that conflict and confrontation are one and the same? Why or why not? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I view them as two slightly different things. When I think about conflict, I think about a situation. I'd love to hear, Kate, what you think as well. Like more the situation at hand and confrontation is more of the means of addressing the situation. And when I think about it um, for conflict, we want to address it in a healthy way. Um, I think of conflict as a means to get to share different perspectives and how you debate those perspectives. And then how you build towards a path of win-win solutions or like an innovative idea you never thought about, personal growth. So I view it conflict in a very positive light when done well in a way that benefits the group. Um, confrontation wise, right, does have a more of a negative undertone, but again, can be done in a positive, thoughtful way if you're intentional about how you confront and coming objectively. Um, so that's my perspective. But Kate, what are your thoughts in terms of how you view those two items? Yeah, I think we have very similar perspectives um, and, and points of view on that, Eileen. Um, I do think, right, there's there's very much negative connotations surrounding both the words conflict and confrontation. Um, and I think that, you know, you can't have, I, I believe you can have conflict without confrontation. But in my mind, if you have one without the other, you're really just going to be dealing with a lot of unresolved issues, right? You have too much conflict and no confrontation. We're just kind of all just churning and swirling, right? And it's just not a great look. Um, I think that, you know, we can start to retrain ourselves on viewing conflict and confrontation, at least, if not positive, in more of a neutral light, right? Especially if we're talking about productive confrontation. Um, I talk about this in, in a few minutes, but I think to, you know, it's hard to just, oh, okay, fine, conflict and confrontation, no problem, it's neutral, like I have no fear of it. It's not, a, you know, it's not a thing anymore. Obviously, we're having this panel for a reason, but 
I think, um, you know, one kind of tactical step people can start to take is to really think about, you know, sort of those innocuous everyday situations where there naturally is conflict, but it's a quickly resolved or easily resolved, right? And practicing having the conflict, having the confrontation, right? And you're starting to retrain your brain in terms of thinking of it as more neutral, right, than negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great points. And I think getting more comfortable with it is something we'll talk about a bit later of how to actually do that a bit more if it's territory that you're uncertain of or frankly, you're trying to completely avoid. Um, so Eileen, before GitLab, like you said, you grew your career in sales strategy at Salesforce. What do you learn about internal communication from such a large company? Yeah, um, this is funny. Right before this panel, we were all chatting for a little bit and I was telling Katie and Kate that um, Salesforce is 80,000 people and come to GitLab is 2,000 people. So how I communicate at both these places, there's similar concepts, but the scale at which I do them is very, very different, especially growing in my career in something that became an 80,000 person company. There was no one direction of how I could communicate effectively. I had to communicate up, down, around, all different directions, right? And I had to learn that a lot of times the hard way, right? You, you, you're you driving a project and you realize I completely missed a set of stakeholders or I, I needed to think about a different way with an executive, different functions, all the above, right? So it really honed me in terms of how do you account your communication to different audiences who may differ from you, whether they're different seniority, um, different, you know, roles and responsibilities who don't speak your language if you are completely different parts of the business, and also never to forget the people who are next to you who can support you, even if let's say they're working on something adjacent but not exactly the same, but can be your cheerleaders or partners along the way. Um, so those that was really important. It's just learning that scale and then coming to GitLab. I think I was able to already have that mindset of let's count for the whole pie versus just a slice of the pie. And then the other piece that was really super helpful um, as I was at Salesforce, again, talking about scale, is try not to use so much energy expended from just yourself outward. Try to see if there are other vehicles that you can communicate on. And these are like through project plans, for example. If I create a project, I try to have something that is my vehicle that communicates for me versus me always yelling from the rooftops. Um, and people can reference without me necessarily being there in the room. Um, I try to see if there are ways to get into like corporate communications, right? Make friends with your friends who are doing those kinds of roles. They are the ones who are going to unlock a ton of channels for you. And I have to say at GitLab, I'm super strongly partnered with our corporate communications and field communications team members. They're my best friends because they will champion what we need to do for the field, right? Um, and this is not just at GitLab, but also when I was at Salesforce. And then the biggest thing, which is actually... Um, point of vulnerability really for me, something I'm actually trying to get better at is uh, continuing to, you know, better, better, never best is how do you be succinct and to the point with your communications? And that also helps scale. If you can say things in fewer words, but get to kind of like the exactly crux of what you need to say, especially if you're talking to executives, um, that's, that's a huge uh, win for you and will help you evolve your ability to communicate internally, whether you're at a smaller company, a larger company, in any different facet, which would be excellent. Mm -hmm. Something I had to unlearn in my career was that hedging, giving too much context or things up front that didn't really get to the point. And um, similar to what we encourage salespeople to do with stakeholders, what's that pain point? What's that main thing you're trying to address? Get to that first and then have a TLDR maybe below. <laughs> exactly. I had to learn that many times the hard way. And then you see their eyes glaze over and you're yeah. like, oh, I, I lost them. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yep. I think we all recognize that face of, oh no, I have, I have lost them. So want to avoid exactly. that. That's great advice yes. all around. Exactly. Uh, and Kate, you worked in customer success earlier in your career, as you mentioned earlier, what strategies did you find most effective when managing customer expectations while also keeping control of the conversation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, brevity <laughs> certainly is key in, in a lot of cases. Um, I think, you know, one of the most important things that I think you can do, right, in, in any conversation, right, whether it's, whether you know it's going to be a positive one or whether it's, you know, a fairly difficult customer who's, you know, having, um, you know, some challenges, I think is is to set the tone, right, because 
whatever vibe you kind of put off right from the get go is going to, you know, it's contagious, right? And so, and I, I don't mean at all to imply that, um, you know, come in and be flippant about something when, you know, a customer is having a real issue, right? That's preventing them from doing their jobs, preventing the company from, you know, moving forward. Um, but I think, you know, coming from a point of, I understand, right? I, I empathize with what you're going through, but also, you know, that point of strength to say, here's some options, let's fix this, right? I'm going to do everything in my power to, to do that. Um, I, I joke with my husband, he's like literally the worst at delivering any kind of information. Um, and I, I should probably have him watch the recording of this panel. <laughs> he'll be humiliated. But, um, you know, I joke with him because he'll, he'll begin, he'll start telling me something, right? And he's got this very serious tone and he's like, oh, oh my gosh, what's going on, right? Did, have you lost your job? Like, are we not going to be able to pay our mortgage? What is happening, right? It'll turn out, you know, oh, I forgot to, you know, get bananas at the grocery store, right? And I'm like, okay, let's talk about how we deliver information. Because if you, you know, if you take this tone that really doesn't match the information or the conversation that you need to have, right? I think you're just, you're not setting the right expectations for how the conversation needs to go, right? And ultimately, whatever the resolution needs to be. Um, so I think, you know, that, that position of empathy combined with strength, right? You feel the person's pain, you understand why it could be painful to them, right, in their role. Um, and here are the options, right? Let's talk through them and come to that from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Eileen, I wonder if you resonate with this as well, given your chief of staff role, but as I've adopted more kind of people-centric responsibilities at our parent company formative, I found that that matching of the tone and, and knowing when to match and when to own your own tone and not meet theirs is really important because sometimes what's super important to them while you should hear them out and listen and make them feel heard doesn't automatically need to be a fire drill for you. And you can kind of help even that out and to learn and know the difference, I think is something that is a skill that's really important early in your career. Oh, yes. Yes. And it's hard to verbalize that sometimes it's just a certain level of like a genesis quad, you're going through the emotions and getting to know people. Every person is different. So the more you're kind of getting the reps with that individual, how they think, how to, what makes them tick, and then getting a sense of their tone to your point. Um, I think is super important. So there's no, it's like probably going to be the answer for a majority of the things we're going to talk about today is no one size fits all to everything. <laughs> it really depends on your scenario and the person you're working with. But I think knowing, knowing that is like the first half of the battle. So super important. Mm -hmm. Great advice all around. Kate, we're going to stick with you for this question and then go to Eileen here. When you're still early in your career, before you've built up the confidence to share an opinion, not to mention push back, what do you recommend our audience do to get more comfortable speaking up? Yeah, it, this is such a great question. And I, um, I, you know, I mentioned in our prep call that, you know, I wish that I had had a panel like this, you know, 15 years ago, right? Because I think, especially for women, right, and especially for women in somewhat, you know, male dominated industries, right, male dominated roles, and certainly, you know, in, in in my case, and I think probably a lot of the people on this call, right, male dominated, you know, meeting rooms, um, it it can be very difficult, especially, you know, when you're kind of lower, right, on the proverbial career ladder rung. Um, and I think, you know, I touched on this before, I think it's really, you know, seeking out safe environments, right, and safe situations where you can, quote, unquote, push back. But it's, it's not going to result in any sort of, you know, long-term trauma, right? Um, so if you think about, you know, and, and maybe this is a fairly traumatic experience for people on the line, but you know, you're deciding what to what to have for dinner, right? And you're talking about with your partner and, you know, they want Thai and you want pizza. And, you know, you know that ultimately you're going to end up eating dinner, right? So it's fairly low risk, right? You know, decently high reward conflict, mm -hmm that you're having. Um, and I think, right, to recognize, to, right, first it's recognizing that that is actually a form of conflict, right? I want something that is different from what my partner wants. Um, 
And I think, you know, being able to come to, you know, do you need to fight to the death for the pepperoni pizza that you've been craving, right? Or, you know, are you able to take a more compromising approach and maybe it's, um, you know, taco night, right? So it's it's something that neither of you had, you know, first brought to the table. And it, you know, it sounds silly, right? And these are obviously fairly minor events, but they occur often enough that I think it's, they're both great practice and great environments to have safe conflict, right? Especially if it's with, you know, a loved one, right? That you're, you're in a relationship with. Um, and I think then when you do find yourself in a more serious disagreement with someone, right? Or a more serious, uh, more high stakes conflict with someone, right? You're better prepared to be able to examine, right? What the alternatives are and how you can come to an agreement, right? Whatever that may look like. And it could be, you know, agree to disagree, right? Um, But at least some sort of a resolution. And I think, you know, looking for those kind of daily occurrences, right? Because they're they're everywhere, right? They they happen all the time. Um, And you know, practicing with things like that just kind of, again, gets to that retraining your brain of, you know, not necessarily thinking of conflict as, as negative. Mm -hmm. Eileen, anything to add there? Yeah, um, I agree with everything you said. I love what you exactly would say with dinner. That's me and my husband, like every other day, every other day, when we do DoorDash or go out to eat or make something. So I resonate with that. Um, Sometimes with a little more high stakes, I would like to admit than I would like to admit, (laughs) (laughs) especially, I mean, if I'm in a hangry mood, but joking aside, it's super funny that this, this, this question came up. I actually had this exact same question posed to me from a team member a couple of years ago when I was in a mentoring conversation. So it, it, it's still very fresh for me today of like what I mentioned to him in that moment of here's what worked for me. Um, doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, isn't uh, you know, the Bible by any means, but these are things that, that worked for me as I was growing my career and trying to think about, hey, how do I, how do I try to feel more confident in building up my opinion, experience of pushback? Cause to your Kate, uh, to Kate, your, your point around there's always going to be that proverbial table and trying to get a seat at it. Um, it's funny in this in this age post COVID, I feel like with a lot of things happening on Zoom, um, online, your square on Zoom is not much bigger than anyone else's. You have equal mm-hmm. footing, even visually. Yeah. Versus before, it's like, hey, could it? Are there enough chairs? Like, do I stand on the side? Like, you know, all these things that race through your head, especially if you're more junior and you're in a male dominant environment as a female and you know, person. So. Um, that helps, first of all, I would say, in terms of setting that stage foundationally, um, everyone is equal on the screen, as we are also right now. Um, and for me, the biggest thing that helped me was just telling myself, be brave for 30 seconds. You don't have to be brave for 25 minutes, 60 minutes, however long it is. Just be brave enough for that moment to say, hey, can I voice something? I have a perspective here. And I did my research, right? Um, obviously, don't come in with, you know, firing different bullets at different things, like have an informed opinion, do your research, prepare in advance. If it helps, you know, I would share my materials early. I, you know, get make sure like, hey, uh, to my manager, if they're in the conversation with me, would you be able to back me up if I brought something up? Like having those little pieces built up my confidence to be brave in the moment when I was more junior. And um, also, I think what helped at the end of the day was if I didn't still didn't feel comfortable, there are other nonverbal ways to build up your confidence in that regard, especially again in this uh, post COVID Zoom dominated environment. I, I would, you know, drop in notes in the chat or, you know, you can do the whole raise your hand, right? Like follow those protocols and then just keep getting reps. Like you're not going to get perfect after one or twice with sharing your opinion if you're not comfortable with it. You're going to get better with it in the fifth time, the 10th time, right? The 20th time. Um, So, you know, give yourself some grace and just be proud that you were able to be brave for 30 seconds is my take on it. I love that, Eileen. And I think um, it it resonates with, uh, I work out at a fitness studio and one of the things that they always say, inevitably, every single class you can do anything for 30 seconds, right? And I think it's it's so true, right? Of course, this is we're talking about planking in that case. 
but um you gotta be brave for that too right yeah I mean but um but you know you really can right as hard as it sounds you can be brave for 30 seconds right and and the first time you're brave for 30 seconds it can feel yucky and really hard and like oh that was that was way too long right it felt like 30 minutes right and then you do it you know and then you do it again and again and again right and eventually you it just becomes a second nature type of thing um I think that's such such a great an important thing to keep in mind because everyone has to be brave at some point, whether they're admitting it or not. Um, and to, you know, I think to keep that in mind is really important. Mm -hmm. I can relate to everything y'all are saying. And I, I would also add the repetition is important, not only to build your confidence, but you start to then see, okay, the way I relayed this information either did or did not achieve the goal I was hoping for. So how do I need to tweak that next time? And so the more that you do it in small scale settings and then work your way up to larger ones, the more you know what actually is effective in getting your message across. So it can be good for many reasons. All right, next question here again is for both of you. Obviously, context is everything. Like you said earlier, Eileen, we're going to be caveating a lot of this with it depends um, on the situation. But in general, how do you disagree while maintaining professionalism at work? And Eileen, we'll start with you. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, this this one, this one again, you need to read the environment. So when, whenever I'm in the situation, I, I don't come in with the here's how I'm going to act a certain way. Um, some some positive, I guess you can call it positive, positive feedback I've gotten from a leader here at GitLab is when I asked them like, hey, how do you perceive me and how I show up to work is he said, hey, I, I view you as a facilitator. I feel like you are kind of like a stream of water. You know, you're able to kind of navigate the hard rocks, things that sort, and then get to the end point at the end of the stream, right? Um, which is valuable when you think about Hey, how do you disagree while maintaining professional work, as you were saying, Katie? Um, even if you're having a hard conversation, right? I think that's that's important. So I think what I took away from that is like I I do when I was reflecting, I do try to always act as a facilitator, no matter which side of the equation I'm in. So what I do is like, hey, can I repeat the perspective of the person who is disagreeing with me, right? Because the first thing is foundationally. Do I understand where you're coming from? We don't even get to that understanding. Like, this is not going to be a productive conversation. Let's just, you know, come back later <laughs> or figure something else out. Um, but that's always just usually step one to getting, okay, can we have a productive conversation? Can we, you know, uh, get to a point where we understand each other's perspective? And then what are what exactly is it that we're trying to discuss in terms of the friction? Because I think once we get to that point, like, Hey, is there actually a misunderstanding? Like we actually on the same page, which actually happens more often than I actually realize. Um, we all agree, but we just think we're coming from different directions is, is, a, is a huge factor. And if there is a clear point of something we need to address, then you know um, uh, we're able to kind of either tackle it in the moment or again, um, you know, you, you, you take the time away to get more information, different perspective and come back again to have that productive conversation. So. The, the key thing is I try to stay objective. It's never about the person, right? The, the moment you go ad hominem, that's the moment you also lose the battle. <laughs> um, and you probably also would feel that, like, I would feel the same way if someone started attacking my character. I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I want to you know, keep going down this path with you. Um, but also something I, I keep in mind, too, is, like, I pick my own battles as well with these types of things. You don't need to win every single conversation. It's not a competition at work. Um, what you're trying to do is like, what is the bigger picture here at hand? You know, what am I trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve? And then again, back to my point of vocalizing each other's perspective, that's helped me understand, okay, maybe what I was saying earlier isn't necessarily as important in the grand scheme of things. This is more important. Let's, let's just keep making progress forward. Mm -hmm. Eileen, you couldn't have teed me up. <laughs> any better oh if, perfect if we, if, One, if like we each other's minds. <laughs> yeah i um you know the the i wish that i had been a stream i'm gonna uh, share a bit of a yucky right uh anecdote um and i think the you know your your chat about just kind of understanding where the other person is coming from so important um and i'll admit it was not something i did in in this particular conversation so i had um launched a, a program you know, a few years ago you know maintain it grew it like it was amazing literally you know i won awards for it and um i was on a call with about a dozen other people and we'll just 
disregard the fact that like maybe this was not the you know best forum for this uh this announcement to have been made but in that call i was told that um in front of all these people that the program was going to be discontinued and i immediately went to you know the the fight or also fight right reaction right there was there was no flight um it was just complete you know i was furious and i you know i couldn't believe that no one had spoken to me at, at all or this was literally the first time i'd heard anything about this and um so you know i i went a little bit off and i said this is a terrible decision right used some pretty pretty strong language for someone like me in a professional setting right and felt yucky right my my stomach was all in knots i was sweating i was you know red and just like it was not my finest moment probably one of my worst moments but um you know why i why i admit to you know this this reaction having happened is because this was just recently right within the last year or so um and you know fairly you know mid to well i would like to think i'm later career than my husband will actually allow me to be when it comes to retirement but um <laughs> you know, it, it's embarrassing to admit that this is how i reacted at this point in my career right and it, i think it's because um it was something i was so passionate about right and it is so hard when you've given so much of your time and energy to putting something in place right and then to just watch it be dismantled you know in front of your very eyes um and the you know environment within which i was told that this decision had been made right so benefit of hindsight of course we're always you know able to monday you know monday morning quarterback um so obviously what i should have done was taken a deep breath and maybe at that point i I would have decided, you know what, this is a completely offline conversation where I'm not even going to, you know, engage with this. Um, and then, right, take that giant step back to say, help me understand, right, how this decision was made, why it was made, right? And to your point, Eileen, just understanding the perspective of the other person. Um, get the facts, right? Rely less on emotion, which, of course, you know, I think, especially as women can be very difficult. Um, and especially when it comes to something that you're really passionate about and proud of, you know, having achieved. Um, so needless to say, not my finest moment, but, you know, it certainly has turned into a learning and growing, you know, opportunity and experience now. Um, and hopefully having shared that with, with all of you here is uh, a reassurance that it can, it can happen to the best of us. <laughs> Yes, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's it's actually really helpful to know that it can happen at any point in your career. This is a forever evolving 100%. learning growth mindset yes. that we're all yes. trying to achieve. So yeah. and I and I think too it's interesting to know that when passion is tied to it, it can come out in a form of that you may not have as much control over. Uh, but if you built yeah. up a certain way of handling things in the past, you can be more prepared for those scenarios in the future. And attending absolutely like this where you hear from <laughs> leaders like yourself. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Eileen, this next question is for you. So you report directly to the CRO now. Does your strategy for pushing back change at all based on who you're communicating with, like a peer versus a manager, for example? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, the funny the funny thing is, and I love Kate. Like I love to hear your your perspective too, since you also reported zero now too. Um, is it doesn't change too much. Um, I would say dynamic wise, there is a slight shift, right? Just given my roles and responsibilities, and and um, I'm, as I've been ramping the past three months into this role, like how do I continue to be a grow into become a good proxy for our CRO and decision making or you know, um, representation of perspective and start to continue to move the business forward when he he has um, more too much on his plate. Um, so yeah, it doesn't change too much given that the people I've been working with in my previous lives doesn't change in, in that sense. Um, what does change though, I would say is um, how I um, think about addressing challenges together um, I think I feel a little bit more empowered in this role to say, hey, let's 
let's tackle the problem together and let's iterate on it. Iteration is a huge value here at GitLab. So we never tried to strike from perfect from straight up the gates, right? And I'm sure that's a pretty consistent value in a lot of other places. Um, but how can we get to a point where we are moving things forward, even if we miss, we have to commit and disagree on a certain piece, right? Um, so I am a little more empowered in my role, but I think in terms of how I communicate with either leaders or you know peers or other managers within an organization, um, that style does not change. But something I did pick up on, I would say, is um, in this role in particular, is try to figure out what are strong opinions from folks and what are opinions loosely held, even if they are spoken the same way. Um, they the, the 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 backing of those types are different, right? And it could be from like the types of words that they're using, or if you're you know back channeling with some other folks who are close to an individual that has those strong opinions, you might get some different information. But that's I think the key, hugest learning I've had in the past three months of like what is the difference between the two? Because that really changes how I think about push pushing back or getting that pushed back um, for myself. But Kate, like, do you yeah. have some experience or what, what's it's, your take? Yeah, it's it's such a great point, Eileen. I think because um, there are, right, just like my husband telling us, you know, telling me that he didn't get bananas um, at the grocery store, I think there is kind of the delivery. And, you know, it's only once you really know someone or, or you know, have, have had some time with them that you can understand both the best way to communicate your points with them, but also understand, you know, if they say it in this way, that's really important to them, right? And if they say it in this slightly different way, it's, yeah, okay, you know, take it or leave it kind of a thing. Um, I think it's really, it really does come with time. And, um, you know, in the in the three days that I've been ramping <laughs> at Prophecy, right, it really is, I mean, that's, that's my focus now is to, um, Yes, I want to know what everyone's, you know, needs are from an enablement perspective, of course, but it's also just getting to know people and understand their styles and how they communicate what they really need versus just, you know, kind of saying things into the universe and not necessarily something that they're desperate, um, you know, to be enabled on or, or you know, a tool that they need. Uh, I think it's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. To switch it up a little bit, Kate, like many on this call, you've been the only female in the room before, physical room, Zoom room, in these all moments, the rooms. <laughs> all the rooms, in these moments, are you more aware of your demeanor and way of relaying conviction? Yeah, um, so I, I won't even, I won't even pretend to say that it depends. Yes, 100%. Um, and I think and that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, right? Um, I would say earlier in my career, I was much more timid when it came to, you know, I was very conscious of where I physically sat, right, in a meeting room. And I didn't feel like it was my right, if even if it were the only chair left, right, it wasn't my right to sit at the head of the table, for example, right, in, in a boardroom. Um, so I think this will you know, it's it's something that I've, I think I'll continue to experience, right? And I think you just sort of learn to live with it, but also learn to address it, right, in the moment. Um, for those of you who joined the, the last panel, which I loved, um, you know, talking about how to set goals, right? We heard a lot about um, planners. So in, and it was laughing because in 2024, I actually decided to go back to a paper planner. Um, I'm loving it. Not least reason why, because it came with stickers. And one of the stickers, uh, which I actually put on today's date, um, says, be honest and true. And I think, you know, it, it could sound a little pithy, right? But if, if we kind of dissect it a bit, right? Could, it's a great thing to keep in mind, I think, especially for women who tend to find themselves, right, as many of us are here, in those male dominated industries, companies, right? And even, even rooms, right? Whether virtual or, or physical. And to me, it really means you have to be honest with yourself about what you value, right? What do you believe in? What are the non-negotiables, right? When it comes to your values and beliefs and you know, kind of, where does your, your moral compass land, right? And I don't mean this to be, you know, any kind of philosophical, you know, discussion, but 
I think the, the hard part, right, is really staying true to that compass. You have just as much a right as anyone else in that room or anywhere, right, to speak up about what your opinions are, right? And when you've decided that you disagree, you have just as much right to, you know, either whether it's on a you know a moral or a professional level, right? You have just as much right to speak up. Um, I think especially in the case of business decisions, it can be really easy to internalize that someone disagrees disagrees with you, but it's rarely personal, right? And I think that's such an important distinction. It's very difficult to kind of start to recognize that, um, especially earlier career, because it's, you know, you can be an overachiever and as soon as just the teeny tiniest thing doesn't go the way that you wanted it to, right? It's, it can be devastating. Um, my uh, father-in-law, before he passed away, um, he, he was a very successful businessman, just had a lot of um, really great advice. And, and I was fortunate enough to be imparted, you know, a lot of his wisdom. And the one thing that he said um, that I, you know, kind of carry with me is, that no matter who you're talking to, right, CEO, whatever job level, right, no matter how large the company is, whatever kind of money they're making, whoever they are, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like we all do, right, assuming we wear pants, right, which during the pandemic, you know, un unclear. <laughs> um, but I think like, that has stuck with me so much, right? It's kind of like, you know, you're told to picture an audience in their underwear to make yourself feel more comfortable with public speaking. That has really stuck with me. And and I'm, I always am respectful, right? It's not that I'm, you know, treating CEOs and, you know, SVPs as like, hey, brother, you know, what are we doing? You know, but it is important to remember that they're human too, right? They, they have more perceived power, perhaps, than you do. They probably are making more money than you. But you have just as much of a right to be there and to have an opinion and to voice that opinion as they do. Full stop. Hmm. Yeah. I don't feel like I even need to say anything to connect the dots because that was so great. <laughs> Eileen, what do you have to add there? Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Like everyone's human at the end of the day. Um, I know there's like social constructs that kind of led up to the fact that, you know, there are some realities in how people perceive how things go in a work environment. And it's, uh, you know, it's up to all of us to to unify that as much as possible. But yeah, everyone's human. I try to figure out what you know commonalities you have with people who are more senior than you. Um, we all have similar interests, right? People like the same things, and that also makes people more human. So knowing knowing them as people versus their their job title helps a ton in, in my mind when I when I'm talking with somebody. Mm -hmm. And along the lines of thinking about managers and how to communicate with them, what does managing up mean to you? And what advice do you have for those who may not feel comfortable with doing this yet? Eileen, we can start with you. Yeah, um, it's it's funny to talk about this because, yeah, my experience of becoming a manager wasn't necessarily by choice. It was, hey, your manager has left the company you should probably lead the team. I, we don't really want to hire someone else. So um, it, it was something on my aspirational roadmap down the line, but I didn't expect it to come so soon. So obviously there was a lot of like, well, I, you know, I'm a prepared person. I don't know what the first thing to do is. So I take a test step back. I talk with my new manager and said like, hey, what are the expectations? I'm new in management. Like, what are the things I should do? So that really helped in it. Also helped having a female manager at the time um, to help bridge the gap. She could kind of give me some of the pointers and tips of, you know, these are the things to look after and what are the things that, especially as a new female manager, what to consider um, that, you know, may be different if your reality and if you're in a different situation. Um, and, the, and the thing coming at the other end, what I reflect on all of it is, even when you need a management, it's less awkward than you think, even especially if you're getting to a point of managing your peers. Um, there's a reason why if you get to that point, you're chosen for that position, lead a team, right? You have the expertise, you have the know-how, people trust you. People aren't just flipping coins saying like, oh, is it going to be Eileen or Kate? Who knows? Haha, <laughs> could be, you know, 
<laughs> different decision each day. There's a reason, right, that you were chosen for that position. And the first couple of things I think that it did that helped me a ton when I first was on this new management track was starting off the right foot with my peers, because that was the point I was like, oh, this is going to be really weird. Like we were peers or friends, right? Now I have to manage you, you know, is there some sort of power dynamic? And the big thing I took away from that is like, I shouldn't have assumed that power dynamic from the get go. Once I had like individual one-on-ones with each of them before we shared that with the broader organization, I got to the point where I was like, okay, I don't need to think about this. I just need to keep thinking about this. And like, how can I help support each other? Because the big thing is it wasn't so much me elevating to the role, but also like, hey, our manage our manager left. How do I and all of us fill that gap? And then naturally, I think over time, we're able to create that motion where, hey, Eileen is now leading the team. It didn't happen day one. It happened much later, but we we're able to work towards that dynamic, if you will. Um, and the biggest thing for me coming to that point was to say, hey, these are things I can help with, right? Given that there's, you know, our manager left here, things I'm going to take on. Here's where I could use your help. And then establishing that beforehand and sticking to that like realistic plan together um, was really valuable. And then I think to the point of earlier, Kate, you were saying like, hey, I wish I had this panel before <laughs> I did all these things, right? <laughs> There is a book that I really appreciate. Again, I wish I had it when I was starting off on management track, but it's called a Make The Making of the Manager by Julie Zhou. Uh, it's a nice, very cute blue book. I actually have it on my shelf right behind me. Um, I reference it from time to time, even though I've been managing teams for, for a few years now. Um, and that is what I think is, if anyone who's new to management, wants to get into management, wants to read that, especially if they're early in career, um, you know, I stepped into that role when I was in my mid twenties. Didn't really know a thing. Super valuable because she went through that exact same experience um, and details that of her learnings, what she got out the uh, got out the other end, and what she wished she knew and wants to impart with uh, the people that are in that similar experience today. Great. I'll make sure to link that resource for everybody in tomorrow's follow up, so you can go buy the book yourself. Um, any yeah. additions to that, Kate? Yeah, I would just say, um, Eileen and I both came to management, you know, it was kind of promotion by vacancy. <laughs> um, and, you know, very similar experiences with that, you know, it, I was friends with my, you know, peers up until then. And I think it's, it, it's really important to remember that, you know, and of course, I struggled. I was like, I, there's no way, how do you, why do you even think I could do this? Right. Um, and for me, it was, yes, you know, I'm the person, right, who's leading this organization now, but there was also, you know, an ever so subtle shift in the attitudes and kind of the, the behavior from my peers, right, who are now my direct reports. And so I think the combination of that, and it certainly, you know, it wasn't all, you know, roses and, and, and unicorns as you would hope it would be, but, um, you know, we, we continued to build on, I think, the really positive personal and professional relationships that we had built as peers. And I think that was 100% critical to me being successful in then, you know, ultimately managing them, right? And there's kind of this weird period of time that you go into, right? Because now you know, you know, what they're making, right? Salary wise, and you, you're the one who has to provide their, you know, quarterly annual reviews and the the feedback and, you know, decide how much of a raise they get. And it's a really, I think for me, it was, it was probably more difficult just like working myself up and getting nervous that they're going to, they're going to hate me and they're not going to, you know, want me to come to happy hour anymore with them. And, um, but I think, you know, it was also a learning experience for them to kind of go from that, you know, friend and peer and kind of, you know, happy hour pal to, okay, this is my manager now, and we're just going to kind of subtly tweak, you know, how we're behaving um, with each other. But I also think it helped them to feel more comfortable, right, managing up to me. Um, and so I think it was, it was a nice sort of segue period when we were in that, in that transition for them to know that they could trust me with anything, Right. And especially as their manager, not only could they trust me with that, but they could also 
you know, they also knew that they could count on me to resolve or remove roadblocks, right, where, wherever there were. So for me, it was a very positive experience, um, ultimately, right? But there was kind of that, oh, gosh, why me, right? How do you No, somebody else should probably do this. Like, there's got to be a million people who are better, you know, suited to this um, position. So I think kind of sometimes, right, being forced out of that comfort zone, right, is, is necessary. Um, and it's, you know, it's, done wonders for for me and my career um it does feel a little yucky at first mm-hmm. again it comes back to repetitions and getting comfortable with it and and practicing exactly. um so I'm curious we have a pretty diverse audience in terms of geo and work type so you have those that are fully back in office some that are hybrid and some that are fully remote how do you think about communication type when you are in sort of a pushback or disagreement scenario that maybe not is that maybe is not happening in real time. So are you sending follow-up emails? Are you hopping on the phone? Are you waiting till you can be in person? What do you think about that? And either one of you that has thoughts can jump in first. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to start. Um, so I've been fully remote for several years, um, even before the pandemic. And so f- I tend to rely on, of course, right, more of the virtual communication tools, right? I love Slack for quick updates, uh, you know, emails for kind of longer updates. But whenever, you know, meetings, right, for the sake of meetings, well, get out of here, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they are necessary, right? Especially when you're trying to talk through something, right, gain consensus, whatever the next steps are. I think they can be incredibly effective if they're done well. but I think more importantly for me, especially, you know, being a fully remote worker is understanding and using the communication channels that are preferred by the people that I need to work with, right? Um, I had a manager once who just cold calling me all the time, right? And I'm, I'm always in the middle of something or I'm in a meeting and I'm like, can you, what is the problem, right? And I came to realize like he, that's how he works, right? He wanted to just talk through things um, when he wanted to talk through things, right? Regardless of, you know, I'm doing, I'm on the do not disturb. I'm in a meeting, right? I'm presenting or something. Um, And so it was certainly unnerving at first, but I think keeping that in mind that that's how he prefers to work, regardless of how I prefer to work, right? Is I think it's that's incredibly important to understand and and to try and accommodate where you can, right? Certainly, if you know, if he had been calling me in the middle of the night, we would have, you know, had to have a conversation about that. Um, But I think, you know, it's it really is important to understand your audience and how they prefer to be not not only communicating with you, but communicated to. Yeah, I had I had a boss who did similar okay, and just you know whenever they have a question whether it's a small hey can you do you know this number yes. or I have this big crisis like what's going on it's, it's scary it's, it's, yeah because you're seeing a name on the phone and you start getting like heart palpitations right yes uh, exactly like classic. this is it well so, it's been fun <laughs> yeah so what I, what I had to eventually get to that person was like hey can you text me before you call me <laughs> And state, yeah. you know, if you can state, like, you know, is it an easy question or a big, hard, hairy one? That helped a little bit if you remember to do it, but we made <laughs> progress. <Yeah. laughs> so I relate. Um, but yeah, a- async wise, I think it's a, it's a huge part here at GitLab's culture. I think the one thing I've been super impressed about a former remote company is intentional about remote, um, even pre pandemic, is um, our CEO is really strongly strong around like if you have a meeting you need to have an agenda you need to have a lot of intentionality while you're spending your time synchronously like mostly on zoom right we we, we only have limited opportunities to be together in person um but people's time is expensive and you know people don't necessarily do their best work if it's peppered with a lot of meetings in between um so async is a huge part of you know that preparation and it, it works especially well if you have like strong rapport, strong knowledge on the project, for example, or if you're like multitasking a lot of different tactical things that require a lot of documentation, um, that works really well. Um, and then we we do the Zooms when we need to like talk things through around brainstorming, things of that sort, like we're just moving progress forward um, with a larger group of people. 
Um, and the super funny thing about in person, again, because I'm in a remote company, I'm I'm an introverted person. So when I was going into the office five days a week, I I was draining my batteries pretty quickly. Um, it's like by the time I get to Thursday, I'm like a husk of my former self, and then you <laughs> have the weekend to to recover and have you all over again, right? Um, <laughs> And that's just the reality of like how my batteries recharge. I do like people. I do like talking to people. It's just my battery will go down to zero much faster than someone has more energy or more extroverted, right? But now in this environment, I see people you know, much less frequently and there's more intentionality again when I see them, which is like offsite or company meeting. Like I'm super excited to see those folks because we're going to either be intentional about established connections. Like these are people I've been working for a year, but I've never seen your face in person. I'm really excited. Or we're gonna tackle this really hairy problem for a new fiscal year and we're just gonna huddle into a room and like do all the whiteboarding, think about the big ideas, like that's also intentional. And those work out really well. Um, I think if you don't leave with any of these motions in intention, then communication while you're not gonna get anywhere no matter what method you mm -hmm. do. Um, so again back to the early comment state your attention over text before you call very helpful <laughs> saves people any health challenges with right. what we were discussing before right. yeah what 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 level alarm fire are we talking yeah. right exactly. and i think that's really helpful that intentional piece and kate you mentioned this too when we were chatting is really understanding the why behind someone else's point of view or their disagreement or yours, really making sure you're firm in that from your own perspective or from theirs. Um, and that intentionality plays a big piece of that. So we have one question here that has been asked. If anyone has anything else, feel free to throw it in in our last few minutes. And then we have several questions that were submitted in the registration. So let's, oh, we actually have two questions in here. Um, let's get to some of these. So um, Nicole asks, any tips for pushing back and or confrontation with managers when the problem is lar a larger theme or a difference of style? Um, sometimes it can be easier to resolve conflicts over like a one-off discrete issue versus like an overall theme that you're seeing. So any thoughts on that? And they list an example here. My manager and I disagree about disqualifying a particular deal versus my manager consistently questions business judgment around prioritization, time allocations. So that theme forming. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good that's, question. Yeah, that's a really good one. Eileen, do you want to start? Yeah, maybe I can kick off, give a couple of like my, my initial thoughts and Kate would love to hear how you think about it. Because it's really different of like, it feels like you're talking, the challenges between talking about the person, yourself, like what, how you operate, like it, it feels like it's, 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 a, it's a confrontation about you versus which we're talking about earlier, right? And you're saying it's easier, Nicole, it's, it's easier when you talk about something that's a third party, that's subjective, right? And that's really tough. I, like I, I, I feel, you know, it's like an attack on myself when someone says, hey, I, I, I don't agree with how you, you do X, Y, and Z, right? How do you manage your time? How do you prioritize? So it feels a lot more real in that regard. Um, what I've had to build up courage to ask is to get asked for that feedback. It's like, okay, I recognize that could you share some examples, right? Could you share some examples where, you know, we could have done, I could have done certain things differently. What is your recommendation on how, like have that dialogue on how to improve? Cause again, you can take it or leave it. Your manager may have perspective, you don't agree with it, right? Again, you're, you're the control of your own professional career, how you want to um, navigate that is up to you. But, um, I would say asking those questions helps again clarify. And maybe it's like, oh, you're right. I've never really recognized that I think about it this way because I'm just so honed in onto the situation at hand. Maybe let me try something different next time around. Can give me some transactional feedback right after I am doing things differently. Um, but I recognize it's not easy. And sometimes, you know, you may just end up having to, again, agree to disagree as you're thinking about your own professional development and style. But Kate, any, yeah, any thoughts think, on your end? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the context, right? So um, if, you know, it, when an observation is made about, you know, your, your work, your productivity, right, whatever that may be, um, I think it's important to, first of all, make sure that it's, it's a true, right, reflection of, of, right, because maybe it is something that you're, Right. And Nicole, this is not, I'm not saying that you're doing something wrong here, but um, 
there is a bit of truth to it, right? Versus, um, you know, kind of a, a pattern of behavior, right? As, as Nicole, you kind of alluded to, um, when you start seeing it as a pattern of behavior, I think that's really where that, you know, um, be honest and true, right? And make sure that you are speaking up if that pattern of behavior is detrimental to your productivity, right? Your ability to get work done. Um, but I do think it it warrants more of a conversation because it's it's very easy, I think, for some people to give, you know, kind of spitfire feedback without kind of thinking how it's going to, you know, affect the other person um, and without providing right evidence and, you know, examples of, of what you they think you may have done, um, you know, right or wrong. And so I think asking questions, right, and just start, you know, trying to understand why they said what they said, right, is a great place to start. And then, you know, obviously, depending on what they respond, you kind of take it from there. Um, but I do think it's important to turn it into a conversation, you know, a two-way conversation and not just, you know, taking the feedback and internalizing it in a potentially negative way. Yeah. And maybe even get like different opinions and your manager might have mm -hmm. one perspective, but does your peer or another cross-functional leader who you work with have the same opinion? Exactly. Maybe it's just your manager who thinks that. Just again, I, I, I don't know the situation at hand, but that is also a possibility. But if you hear the reinforcing piece, like, yeah, I do notice, but I've never really shared that with you. You know, maybe that'll give it some more weight and you can address it more consistently. So again, if you're comfortable going down that path, that is an option too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good advice all around. Next question here. How do you professionally handle conflict and difficult conversations when you are emotionally vulnerable? So all of us have times when we're at work, but there's a lot of personal stuff that's in the back of our brain. And sometimes it's hard to keep it back there from letting it infiltrate a current conversation at work. Um, so what are your thoughts on that and how you sort of do or don't compartmentalize or handle those scenarios when maybe it's coming to light an emotional state when you're having a conversation with a manager around performance? Oh, I've definitely teared up during a couple of feedback sessions. Hundred <laughs> percent. We're all lying. Same. Not, right? yeah. like, oh, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. I'm exaggerating, but I, I, I um, am not trivializing this because I, I've done it and we've lived through it. Um, but it's. It's not like something you can change overnight, right? I think part of it is uh, what helped me and not saying it's gotten any easier when you receive feedback is being able to write things down first. I think like visualizing it on paper in your head of the things that like you know, doing self-reflection beforehand, um, either of questions you want to ask or like feedback you're about to get or what, whatever the, the thing you're anticipating where you will be in that more difficult situation where you do feel more emotionally vulnerable helped me a ton. I'm not saying it got me perfect through the first couple of times you're doing it. Repetition helps. And just getting yourself to be used to those scenarios, I think, is super valuable. And over time, you will find stability and you'll get to the point where you feel, I feel comfortable with the state of being. The comfort, the comfort around being just uncomfortable. Really, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. feedback's not meant to make you feel soft and smooth and happy all the time, right? It's supposed to help you push for change and grow as an individual, which you know can trigger these these feelings. Yeah, um, I I agree with everything you said, Eileen, and I also want to add. Um, I took a look at the the full question, and it um, sounds like there might be some bigger uh, issues at play there, Megan. Um, I think if you have the right relationship or if you have this type of a relationship with your manager, right? Um, I The last year has been pretty difficult for me just on a personal level, a lot of health challenges, you know, myself as well as, um, you know, across my family. And it's, it was too much, right? I couldn't, I couldn't not bring it to work, right? As much as I tried. Um, and there were, you know, I would be on calls, we're talking about, you know, our content strategy, and I'm just crying, you know, turning off my camera, because I just, it was too much. And so I think if you, if you have the type of relationship with your manager, where you can let them know, hey, I'm going through a rough time, right? And it's not, you know, 
maybe it's, uh, you know, hopefully it's not impacting your ability to, to do work, but I think it's important to be honest with where you are, right? It can be scary to be vulnerable and, you know, to tear up, especially if you are managed, you know, working for, for a man um, or, you know, someone who identifies as male, you know, it can be really embarrassing, but I think there's, you know, everyone's always going through something and it's more than likely that that person is also experiencing something, right? That's not the greatest thing in their lives. Um, so I think being honest with yourself about the relationship that you do have is really important. And, um, you know, maybe if there is additional help that's needed, you know, certainly seek that out. Yeah. Great thoughts. And I think my one addition to that too, is it's okay in the moment to be getting that feedback and saying, you know what, can we pause this for a minute? Like, can I, can we schedule time to come back and talk about this later today? Um, I've got some personal stuff going on and I just need a minute. So I think taking both of what, what you both said and, and making sure that people are proactive in that and feel like they can set those expectations with their manager um, are great. And we are over time. This was a great session, a lot packed in here. Thank you both so, so much for sharing your insights in this conversation. Thank you for your vulnerability and transparency. For our audience, we are going to send a, a follow-up tomorrow with the highlights from the conversation today, as well as any of the resources that were mentioned. Um, and as a reminder, Eileen coming from GitLab, which is a partner of WISE, they are hiring. So if you're interested in exploring opportunities at GitLab, definitely check out womeninsaleseverywhere.com to sign up for a membership and access the 30 plus partner companies that we have hiring, including all those open roles at GitLab. Our next member exclusive event is February 29th, where our inner alignment coach, Jessica O'Kane, is going to lead a workshop on mental fitness and emotional resilience. So if you're a member, definitely sign up for that. As always, we invite you to come for the conversation and stay for the community. And with that, we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi.